Uh, my name is Shane Stevenson. I'm the Director of Museum Collections here at the Buffalo Naval Park, and I'm sitting in my office on the USS Little Rock, which is important to today's story. And we are with uh, the author of Warship Builders, an industrial history of U.S. naval shipbuilding, 1922 to 1945, uh, Dr. Thomas Heinrich. And he is with uh, City University, uh, City Cooney uh, Baruch, which I was not very familiar with the college at all, um, but it's right in the heart of uh, New York. Is it? Is it right? That's right. Yes, we're in 25th and Lex. So. Uh, oh, hey, very good. Yeah, it's right in the middle of things. Uh, he's written various books. Uh, he has a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in modern U.S. industrial history. So that's a, a really uh, specialized. Uh, course of study there. And this goes right into uh, his book about warship building. Now the, uh, the connection today, uh, and this is the reason why we chose this, is this is the birth, right, or the launching today of USS Little Rock. So she was launched, or as we sometimes say, birthed uh, on this date in 1945. And she was constructed at the Cramp Shipbuilding Company out of Philadelphia. And that's, I think, the germ of Dr. Thomas's uh, book, this book, it comes from uh, his research into the Cramp Shipbuilding Company. So we now have 13 attendees. Welcome, Dr. Thomas. Uh, we want to keep this organic. If you have a question, you could uh, type it in our, um, you could type it in uh, Zoom, and we'll get to your questions as we go along. So welcome, Dr. Thomas. How are you? Very good. Thank you so much for this very kind introduction. I do want to say that actually I am a proud graduate of uh, SUNY Buffalo as well. I did my master's over there uh, a long time ago in 19, what was it? I finished in 1988, but uh, I was an exchange student from Germany and, um, and uh, you know, just Love Buffalo, always have, uh, always will, and uh, uh, was actually just there last week. So in any event, um, you know, thank you all for coming to this event. And uh, well, you know, let me just get right into it. So this book, uh, you know, just came out last year, November 2020. It was got published by Na uh, U.S. Naval Institute Press in Annapolis, and. Um, and it has a little bit of a background that I want to just briefly talk about. Shane mentioned earlier that uh, that I had researched the history of, of cramp shipbuilding, which is the uh, which is the the um, the builder that that constructed Little Rock, but many more. Um, so let me just see if I can get on this. This is my first book. I wrote one many years ago. It's called Ships for the Seven Seas, Philadelphia Shipbuilding in the Age of Industrial Capitalism. That book was really for the most part, uh, or cramp, let's just say, was the anchor of that. And uh, it carried the story really of the Philadelphia shipbuilding industry up until 1929 to the onset of the Great Depression. Now, um, uh, Philadelphia during that time, Delaware Valley was really kind of the, 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 the hub of the American iron and steel shipbuilding industry for a long time. And Cramp itself was, was kind of the, 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 the core of that in so many respects. Uh, Cramp actually built half the fleet that fought in the Spanish-American War of 1898, just to kind of give you a sense of the dimensions, and was really America's leading battleship builder as well. Uh, for a very, very long time. Now, uh, this book, Ships of the Seven Seas, it ends in 1929. Uh, Cramp had already gone bankrupt uh, two years prior. Um, and uh, well, let me see if I can get the, uh, the next photo in here. Yes, and so this is what it looked like. This is what it looked like in the mid 1930s, Cramp did, Cramp shipbuilding. Uh, you know, a really desolate place in many respects. Uh, you know, again, the birthplace really of the modern American steel navy. Um, it was a sad sight to see. Um, what happens really very quickly then at the beginning of the Second World War in 1940, Franklin Roosevelt, um, who was a ship buff, by the way, who loved cruisers, battleships, destroyers, submarines, submarines, not so much, but, um, but in any event, um, 
he was very keen actually already in 1940 to commence rearmament on a on a massive scale, on a significant scale. Most famously, he called for, for construction of, of, of manufacture really of, of 50,000 airplanes a year, uh, which the United States then, then uh, doubled. But um, he was equally keen on, on rebuilding the US Navy. He had done some of this uh, over the course of the 1930s, uh, but uh, in so many ways, the, the, the story particularly of, of uh, the Second World War industrial mobilization starts in 1940 with the passage of what's called the Two Ocean Navy Act, the Two Ocean Navy Act of 1940. Uh, that was really intended and designed to equip the United States with a fleet that could fight on both oceans, that is in the Pacific and the Atlantic. Um, this was really based on a very grim strategic assessment that in all likelihood uh, well, first of all, France was already defeated in June of 1940 when this program was launched. And, um, and uh, but the expectation was that Great Britain would succumb to the Nazis as well. So the idea was that the United States would have to confront the possibility that it would fight Germany, Japan, and Italy alone. And that is kind of the background to really kind of the reconstruction of, of the American shipbuilding industry, particularly of Cramp, and you see this here. Um, this is Cramp shipbuilding, and uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow here, but uh, you know this one. Can you see it, Shane? Can you... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You got yeah. It. Here's here's uh, here's actually two two of the um, of of the Cleveland class cruisers that were built at at Cramp. I think this is actually Little Rock. Uh, you know, one of the this is Miami. This is Astoria. Uh, and um, I think if I if I might pipe in here, uh, okay. Dr. Thomas, I think the keel, which is almost towards the center right, the keel I've seen the, right there. That is the USS Little Rock. Uh, I that's the Little Rock. I, that, yeah. Well, thank you. No, this is the, you know it does give you a sense. I mean, a cramp like many of these organizations like many of the shipbuilders, uh, you know, was a very, very complex organization. Uh, and as far as the shipbuilding industry is concerned, uh, you know, number one, and this is one of the stories really that the book tells, is that uh, this was a complex industry that very heavily relied on highly experienced and very well-trained labor uh, and, uh, and management as well. Uh, you, it is very, very difficult to train a naval shipbuilder overnight. Um, that was a little bit different when you kind of look at merchant shipbuilding during the Second World War. Liberty ships, very important story, but you know, oftentimes told. Um, and if you know Henry Kaiser introducing welding techniques and all these things, uh, you know, to turn out well, you know, we built twenty seven hundred Liberty ships over the course of the Second World War, right? So. Um, this was in so many respects. When you kind of look at the look at the merchant ship building program, that was um, that was a, a mass production effort, really, at so many levels. You did not do that in naval ship building. Naval ship building was in many many respects uh, uh, what's called a custom industry, custom con production, and. Um, or batch production at the very best. You know, when you kind of look at the Cleveland class cruisers and Little Rock and Miami were Cleveland class cruisers, uh, we completed uh, 24 of those during the uh, 27 over the course of the war. So that's not a lot really compared to, you know, 2,700 Liberty ships, right? Um, it speaks to the fact that, uh, that this is a very complex undertaking. Building a warship is really a whole different animal, really compared to anything that you are doing with uh, that you're doing with merchant construction. Uh, warships are designed uh, with double, triple, quadruple backup systems uh, because you know they're not supposed to cruise the oceans and evade submarines. They're supposed to take the fight to the enemy, right? And that is what in so many respects uh, is, is incorporated in the naval architecture and the marine engineering of these things. When you are looking at the Little Rock nowadays, uh, you know, there's this a, a tremendous amount of, 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 of backup systems, 
uh, that were built into that ship and into many, many more of those. Um, in any event, so, you know, that's one of the things, one of the points that the book is trying to make, which is really about naval shipbuilding. This is not about liberty ships or, or victory ships or merchant construction or tankers um, by any stretch of the imaginations, right? This book is about battleships, aircraft carriers, destroyers, submarines, um, and cruisers, very important that we see here. Um, so again, I mean, these are complex organizations. It's difficult to train the workforce. Uh, Cram had a really tough time, I will say. The Delaware Valley was lined with shipyards still at that point. Uh, Cram was not the only one. There were several smaller ones. In addition to one of the largest, and that was right across the river from Cram, and that was uh, New York Shipbuilding Corporation. Um, and uh, that is, you know, in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, a little bit farther down the river was the Philadelphia Navy Yard, uh, you know, a huge organization that would build battleships, cruisers, and, uh, and uh, aircraft carriers. Uh, a little bit farther down the river was, was a Sun ship building, uh, which survived actually until the 1980s that would, would build tankers, oil tankers primarily. And uh, so, I mean, this, this was a densely settled urban environment. There were other important organizations settled around the shipyards. Uh, you know, there were companies that built specialty parts uh, that would build windlasses, that would build, uh, were very important, by the way, Westinghouse was by the river in Philadelphia and, um, and built, uh, built, built turbines, turbine engines. Uh, uh, Babcock and Wilcox, uh, you know, was in Jersey, uh, was was very much engaged in high pressure boiler construction. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of stuff industrially that happened around this area. Now, Cramp was the last shipyard to kind of reopen after it had gone bankrupt in 1927, it reopened in 1940 and had to be rebuilt really, and had to be reconditioned. And you kind of see that here. Now, one of the problems with this organization was, it was with this organization was, it was trying to do too many things. And I wrote an article about that many years ago. It's called Jack of all trades. And the implication is that you're Jack of all trades and master of none. Um, and what you see here again, I mean, these are cruisers and this is hard difficult and demanding business to build these things, right? New York ship across the river built nothing but cruisers. Uh, while, you know, some of these Cleveland class cruisers, they were converted into, into aircraft carriers, light aircraft carriers. But, uh, but, you know, it was still the basic same naval architecture, it was the same hulls. Um, but uh, in any event, so, you know, this is very demanding and difficult business. And in a New York ship had the good fortune to be able to build those, uh, uh, you know, to concentrate pretty much on, on, on the one type. What you see here is again, these are light cruisers. These are submarines, Balao class submarines, or Gado class later on. Um, and, uh, you know, that is also a very difficult business. What you have here is, is repairs, and that up here is a dry dock. What Cramp was attempting to do. Um, was was combine the four most difficult jobs in the shipbuilding and ship repair industry, uh, and uh, and I might say it it had it faced significant challenges with that. Uh, the management was inexperienced. Uh, you know this place had been had been idle for thirteen years. They rehired some of the old workers, uh, some of whom were unfortunately past their prime. They rehired some of the old managers who were also significantly past their prime, uh, who had a, had a devil of a time really trying to, trying to uh, you know, complete these ships. You know, Little Rock was supposed to have been really completed by the end of 1943 and not launched in August 27, 1945, right? So um, in that respect, and by the way, uh, a far better organized New York ship across the river did complete the Cleveland last class cruises in a far shorter amount of time. These things were in the water, uh, most of them in 1942, and uh, they were deployed in the Pacific by 1943 and were fighting. Uh, Cram took its sweet time to, uh, to complete these contracts. And it is in part, again, because it really bit, bit off far more than it could chew. All right, what do we have here? Um, so these are the turrets and um, 
uh, well, actually, a, a Torah Foundation for for the for the Cleveland class cruisers. Uh, for I think this this is for the Miami that was the first one that was laid down at Cram, and uh, you know it tells you a little bit you know about the lock work that was going on. Um, this is again a picture that I took out of uh, out of this article, and the reason why I'm talking a little bit more about that is obviously because uh, because that article also dealt with Little, little Rock and with Miami and Astoria, and Oklahoma, but. Um, so what these guys are really doing is precision work. Uh, you see that here, uh, that this Loftman is copying outlines uh, of, of, of a, a like Cruiser Foundation. And what they really make out of, based on these, on these full scale drawings, I mean, these, these, are, these are full scale, uh, you know, they start, they start making so-called uh, molds and, uh, and, you know, and those are then used uh, to be copied onto steel and, uh, that is being done in the shop, and and um, let me see, uh, yes, and so you know, eventually you get this, right? I mean, that's that's a that's a, uh, a six inch uh, turret uh, that was manufactured for little uh, for one of the the Cleveland class cruisers that was under construction at Cramp. I can't guarantee that that was actually Little Rock, but what you see here is you know that's the face plate, um, and um, you know, and it speaks to the fact. I mean, this this was heavily armored. A heavily armored turret now, nowadays. I mean, you kind of, I think, you know, when you go now in, in the Little Rock, you can still sort of see this lifting me mechanism, right? Uh, this is kind of cool because, yeah, it also, it does give you a sense, you know, just this, these are heavy steel plates. They're very difficult to manufacture. This, I want to say it was done at Homestead in Pennsylvania, um, at the, at the Carnegie Mills, at Carnegie, Illinois. And, uh, and you know, to manufacture one of these, one of these uh, armored plates, um, which was really designed to, to, to have an incoming, an incoming um, uh, uh, shell to break it up. I mean, this, is, this was ultra hardened steel. To manufacture it, uh, it really took between six and nine months for one. So that kind of gives you a sense. I, you know, this, these were also extremely complex and demanding. Let me turn my lights back on. Um, demanding bits of, of, of equipment, and uh, you know, uh, you needed an enormous amount of of, uh, of workplace skills really to make those. Right, and here you kind of see a lot of these. You know, these are the workmen. Um, that are installing these very, very complicated mechanisms. You have to remember, I mean, this is really, uh, in some respects, it's precision work uh, that uh, requires a lot of training. Um, so, you know, again, I mean, remember, so, you know, you have one of these plates that weighs 32 tons, right? Uh, and to kind of put it into place, this and had to be precision cut and all of that. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very significant, a uh, bit of, of precision work kind of combined with, with very big pieces of, of, uh, of, of armor plate. All right, what do we have next here? Uh, doctor? Yes, go ahead. Yes, Dr. Tom, thank you. Um, can you, so you said the workforce was kind of spread out throughout, you know, all of the shipbuilding that was going along in the, in the Delaware Valley, as you were mentioning. Uh, so did Cramp, uh, is specifically Cramp, did they have programs, job trainings in place to try and ramp up as quickly as possible? Or, uh, you know, how did they address that for the Loftman and, you know, the guys you see here with, even though that might not be Cramp, it's specifically, but can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, very good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, they, they put into place training programs uh, involving, well, uh, high schools through and, and vocational schools throughout Philadelphia. Um, Again, I mean, this all had to be done on the fly, and uh, you know, and and I mean, I don't want to say it was a substandard workforce, but in some respects, it really was. Uh, you know, a lot of these guys. I mean, for really for for a Navy welder to get trained and to get trained well. I mean, the comp is always the Navy Yard, the Philadelphia Navy Yard, or for that matter, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and. Um, and uh, the average time that it took to train a welder in Brooklyn uh, was was six months. And you couldn't do that really in Philadelphia for various reasons, because you know, I mean, these things, these ships were supposed to be welded and and uh, you know and put together fast, fast, fast. Um, 
And that's when construction mistakes just, you know, proliferated left and right. Because, yeah, a lot of these guys, they should have gotten more training. That's the point, right? Um, you know, I don't know if anybody here in the audience is familiar with, uh, with a guy by the name of Howard Zinn. Howard Zinn is a very famous historian, civil rights activist, who wrote the People's, People's History of the United States, uh, big time lefty. I might add progressive, liberal, all of this. Well, uh, he started his career at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in 1940 as a ship fitter. And, uh, uh, you know, so he is a Jewish boy out of Brooklyn and uh, he got picked. Uh, the Navy Yard was looking to train uh, 300, 300 um, ship fitters. Uh, they got 20,000 applications, 20,000 applications. He got picked uh, and, uh, you know, he went through a rigorous program that actually he described in a wonderful oral history uh, that is deposited at the, Brooklyn, at the Brooklyn Historical Society where he talks about, you know, he's learning how to do all these things. Uh, you know, he, he's fresh out of high school. Um, and, uh, and so he's learning from these guys, you know, who've been, well, who've been building battleships and aircraft carriers really for quite a while, who know every nook and cranny of that shipyard. And, and, uh, and you know, they're teaching him and, uh, you know, and they're whacking him overhead when he's doing something wrong. And they explain to him, you know, oh my God, you know, you know nothing how to put that screw in there. You know, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> and, uh, and so he describes this so vividly. He also, by the way, describes race relations on the shipyards, uh, which were never very good. Um, African American workers had, uh, you know, were usually recruited uh, at Cramp and at a lot of other places, really, for the dirtiest jobs anywhere. Um, they were, you know, uh, uh, poorly paid and all of this. Uh, I mean, on the other hand, they liked working on, on shipyards because it gave them a foothold in, in, in this in this, you know, a relatively prosperous industry that they were hoping to uh, to uh, continue working at uh, during the post-war period. But in any event, so, you know, Howard Zinn talks about really what it took to become a good ship fitter. And eventually he ended up building, building the battleship Missouri uh, that fought in the war. And, and uh, you know, that ended up in Antarctica Bay in 1945 and had the, uh, had the Japanese surrender signed it on top of that deck. Uh, Howard Zinn worked on that deck. So in any event, you know, that kind of gives you a sense as far as the training is concerned, in many instances was very rigorous, um, rigorous and particularly at the Navy Yards and other places, not so. And that was, you know, that included cram very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, you know, and I'm sure you a lot of your volunteers, you know, who work on this ship. I mean, the, I, the, you know, on the Sullivan's as well, right? And then the sub. Um, you know that this is hard work and you better know what you're doing. You, you are dealing in many instances with advanced systems, uh, you know, that, that uh, while in the war, that was not a museum, not yet, right? Um, uh, we have another question, yeah. doctor, if you don't mind. Sure, absolutely. Um, uh, the question, it comes actually from Paul Marzello, who is our president and CEO here at the Naval Park. So he's uh, tuning in and thank you for doing that. Paul, and he asks, do we know how many workers uh, would be assigned to each ship uh, front, you know, start to finish? Um, it fluctuated really throughout the construction process. Uh, you know, I don't have the exact number for the cruisers, for the battleships, I have them. It's about, uh, um, it's about three and a half thousand. Uh, that is for the Iowa class battleships that got built in Philly and in Brooklyn. Uh, so that's about three and a half thousand men. And for, again, for the most part, we are talking about men and, uh, you know, women, women were very far few in between. I mean, they really trickled into the shipyards gradually. The book has something about, you know, has, has a little bit of a story about that, the extent to which, well, you know, they faced misogyny and all of this. And then, and, and, you know, um, eventually women did get a foothold. Uh, you know, on the slipways and and in the workshops, and eventually even in supervisor uh, intermediate level supervisory positions. But in any event, so it's about three and a half thousand for a battleship. For a cruise, it's probably a little less. Um, but um, yeah, you know, and it fluctuates throughout. You know, for the keel laying, relatively little, but you know, then it kind of ramps up once you get to once you get to the hull plating, and then you know the bulkheads and all of this. 
uh, you know, and then kind of this. I mean, a lot of this is also going on in parallel, right? I mean, they're working on the they're working on the turrets um, and on a lot of other stuff that I'm going to get to in a minute um, in parallel with with the hull construction. So. Uh, yeah, you know, but it's about, you know, I, I, I would venture to say about two and a half thousand for the cruisers. Um, this is a new technique that comes into play, uh, you know, that got experimented with in the 1930s. Uh, what you see here is that it's the old riveting technique. Um, this is a pneumatic riveting gun here uh, that you see here. Uh, you know, this is out of my book, but uh, it explains actually the origins of, of, um, of, of, uh, electric arc welding, which is what you see down here. But, you know, the traditional technique is, you know, you, you know, this looks so schematic and, you know, but what this really is, what you see here, that's a rivet. Uh, in Little Rock, you see that actually at, in, in, at, at midships, uh, the, it's the midships section that is still riveted, uh, the front and, and end part, you know, after, before uh, they're welded. I'm gonna talk about that sec, but, you know, this rivet here, that thing for the little rock uh, weighed about two pounds. <laughs> and, you know, they had to heat that to, to a near melting point, to a near melting point, shove it in here, shove it into this hole, right into the overlap, and then hammer it flat with the riveter's gun here. You have a holder on, you know, who's holding it in place, right? So, um, wow. yeah, and you do that, you do that several hundred times a day. I, I, I mean, these kids usually get paid by the piece. Um, so uh, then, you know, you get in the 30s, the introduction here of electric arc welding, and, you know, that looks a lot simpler, but you also had to know what you're really doing with the electrode. Um, by the way, it was very difficult to retrain riveters to work with welding because when you are holding a pneumatic riveting gun, you know, which, which, which vibrates, uh, you know, if you do that all day long, you don't have the steady hand to 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 uh, weld the seam here with an electrode, and, and so uh, it was always difficult to retrain these guys, and uh, you really had to start from scratch. In any event, so you know, this is a new technique comes around uh, for an aft section and Little Rock are welded. Um, there were always concerns, really, about about the structural integrity, really, of riveted of riveted joints and. Uh, as it turned out, actually, over the course of the Second World War, there were a number of instances that the Navy kept tightly under wraps. Uh, I think it was the cruiser St. Louis that lost her bow um, because it was welded. And, uh, you know, that was in a typhoon under special circumstances and all of that. But, uh, but yeah, so welding is a new technique that comes around uh, and, you know, it's being, it's being used sparingly in the beginning, you know, the carriers of 33, that is Yorktown and Enterprise, uh, that's where it was used uh, on a significantly larger scale. Um, and uh, that is electric arc welding. You see that here, this is the construction of Battleship was uh, Washington, that's at, in Philadelphia, a Navy yard. And yeah, you kind of get a sense of, of uh, you know, all these wire, you know, all the, 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 the wire and the cables, you know, get stretched across the hall here, right? Um, and let me see. Oh yes, um, one of the things that they ran into in riveted hull, in, in welded hull construction was <laughs> was uh, um, that weld seams they shrink they shrink when they're cool. Mm -hmm. That shrinkage is very very difficult to predict. And what happened actually, you know, I mean, you kind of see this here, right? I think Washington was 760 feet long. Uh, in the Iowa class battleships, the Iowa class battleships were 888 feet long. What happened at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in New York was <laughs> that the, the, the welds and the keel, they shrank at an uneven pace, hmm. at an uneven rate. So the, the bow in, um, or the keel actually in Iowa was bent slightly to starboard. They had to, they had to redo the whole thing because you cannot drive a battleship around with a bent keel, right? And, and so they had to, they had to uh, correct that. Again, over 880 foot distance of steel, right? As you weld this together, you get weld shrinkage. And you know, and if it's just you know, one tenth of an inch. So in that way, uh, this is a new technique. So lots of experiments going on with it. Uh, and and uh, you, know, you have to train the workforce to do it and do it right. What else do we have? Oh yeah, so you know sometimes 
you know, kind of see this here, there's still riveting going on, right? Um, and uh, that is one of the problems that you kind of see in, in quite a bit of, of, uh, of uh, naval construction, right? I mean, these guys, they had to work in such tight spaces. The naval architects that made the plans for these things, uh, you know, for these, you, you know, the, the, while the, the riveters were always begging the naval architects, please take into account what we have to do in these tight spaces. We have to carry all this stuff in here, right? And, uh, you know, we have to drill the holes. We have to, you know, bring the pneumatic riveting guns. Please make us plans and blueprints where we can actually move our hands, you see this here, very significant problem, really. And, you know, again, I mean, there's, there's uh, you know, a lot of disagreement going on yeah, between the, the guys who have to execute these, these operations and, uh, and the naval architects and marine engineers that are sitting in air conditioned uh, drafting rooms, right? Anyway, so that's that. <laughs> anyway, so here's another interesting one, that is the turbines. Um, these are actually battleship turbines. Uh, similar really to the ones that got installed in, in, in the Cleveland class and in Little Rock. I was actually hoping at some point uh, that, I don't know if you're ever going to do that, that uh, you know, you're going you're gonna to take off uh, the lid of one of, of one of the turbines so that we can actually see what's going on and going on underneath. You know, that's a turbine, that's a, that's a core turbine. I want to say this also uses Washington battleship, you know, get laid down at, at Philadelphia in 37. But, um, you know, the, uh, you have to remember, I mean, the, these are tremendously, these are the core bits of a tremendously powerful drive, right, of an engine drive. And, uh, um, and so I, what you see here is, is uh, you know, these things, these are the blades, right? These had to be preci precision machined and they had to be each and every one of those installed by hand, by hand. These guys, they're working with micrometers uh, to make sure that this, that these, that these propeller, that these blades are fitting as tightly as possible to the case. Right? That gives you a sense. And you know, each and every one of those turbine systems uh, in a battleship, you know, it's you know designed for, for what 52,000 horsepower times four, right? Because the battleships had four engines, like, like the Cleveland class recruited. Mm -hmm. But that kind of gives you a sense. I mean, there's an enormous amount of precision work that is involved here. Um, and uh, well, what else do we have? Oh yeah, this one, <laughs> that's the double reduction gear. Again, I mean, you have that in the battleships, you have that in the, in the carriers, but also in the cruisers. Uh, the, the amount of precision work that went into this, uh, just so you know what's going on here. Um, so uh, what you have really is, is uh, uh, one of the issues with propulsion is that, that, you know, a turbine really runs most effectively, or the turbines that they installed in the cruiser's battleship, at about 5,000 RPM. Uh, if you put 5,000 RPM in the water, uh, all you get is foam, right? Uh, and so what you have to do with this is you have to reduce from about, you know, 5,000 RPM, you have to get that down. Um, I think in the, in the cruisers, it was about three, 300 RPM. The way you do that is by way of reduction here. And that is what you see here. Uh, you know, to, to call that precision work, I mean, it's, it's a mild understatement. Uh, the, the, um, the reduction gear in, in the battleship had to be had to be precision engineered to one ten thousandths of an inch, one ten thousandths of an inch. That's the thickness of cigarette paper. And you know, when you kind of look at the main gear here, they, they call that the bold gear. Um, uh, you know, that was two hundred inches in diameter. You have, you know, to manufacture something like this and to forge it. Right? I mean, so you had to do this in temp temperature controlled environments. It usually took about a month to to make this and, uh, you know, to, to grind it, you could not stop. Once you, you know, once you cut the gear, once you started cutting the gear, you had to keep going. Uh, it had, this had to be controlled in a temperature control environment, 67 degrees Fahrenheit over a period of a good 30 days, right? This is what you're talking about in terms of, of precision work that went into, that went into the production gear. I wanna say actually the, the ones for the cruisers, they were either made in Schenectady, New York, um, at General Electric, 
or in, in uh, what is it, in Pennsylvania, uh, I think in Erie, in Erie, Pennsylvania, GE had another uh, gear, gear cutting corporation over there. So again, there's a lot of this kind of stuff that went into the, that went into the project. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, doctor, I will say that uh, for our uh, double reduction gear on USS the Sullivans, it, the manufacturing stamp is from Farrell and Birmingham here in Buffalo, New York. So that was a, that's one of the stories that we like to tell here is that the double reduction gear that was in San Francisco when the Sullivans was being constructed came from Buffalo, New York. But ah, very good, very fabulous. good. Yes. yes, so you know, and I mean, well, uh, you know, Buffalo's tremendous history of the engineering industries, right? Uh, yeah, and then you know, you you found a lot of people, you know, in Buffalo and Tonawanda and and you know, <laughs> you know, like you know, who knew, you know, who were well trained craftsmen. And right. that's what I, I guess, you know, it just speaks again to the fact which the book reiterates over and over again. You got to know what you're doing when you're looking at this kind of degree of, of, of precision work. Uh, you know, all with all respect, you know, to the world's derivatives, but you know, you cannot, you cannot train people for two, three or four days and put them on this kind of work. You ruin this, you ruin this, that's going to cost you, you know, a good million dollars and, and you know, and about, you uh, uh, eight to 12 weeks of last time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, again, I mean, this kind of one of those things the book reiterates, you know, here that, you know, those are the, these are also the, um, the, uh, the, the, the um, um, machinists who are, who are then working on, on, um, on the shafts, right, on the propeller shafts. Uh, and, Again, I mean, for the Little Rock, uh, you know, for the, for the whole Cleveland class, uh, I mean, one of the things that you have to do with these, uh, you know, you have to mill them and, uh, you know, the, you had to actually manufacture those in, in the lengths of 80 feet each. Uh, you couldn't do this. You couldn't do this, uh, you know, mm. think in Little Rock, what, how long are they? How long are the propeller shafts? You know, I want to say, you know, they stretch from the midships, you know, to the end. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you know, that's probably a good 250 feet. So, you know, these are actually made in sections. Um, and uh, you kind of see this here again, you know, I'm talking about precision work uh, that is, you know, being done here. Uh, and, you know, the, this is the final polishing up. What else do we have? Oh, yes. So, uh, you know, this is Miami. Um, and uh, Miami was actually the first one of these uh, to be launched out of the out of Cramps uh, out of Cramps Cleveland class ones on December eighth, nineteen forty two. That is actually a day after. That was a day after uh, the the the, the, the uh, battleship New Jersey was launched and down down by the Navy Yard mm. by the river. But uh, yeah, so they're making launch preparations, which was a very complicated business, actually. You can see this here. Uh, you know, there's lots of supports that had to be put in, um, you know, as far as launch preparations, you know. When you're putting, you know, the hull probably launch weight, I want to say for the light cruises launch weight, it was probably, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of four or 5,000 tons, right? So you're putting four or 5,000 tons of steel into the water, right? Uh, it's a complex undertaking. Uh, you see this here, you know, these are the launch ways. These are the launch ways underneath it, right? Um, so you had to grease those, well, with very carefully measured amounts of grease and soap. Um, big, well, and you had to measure carefully because uh, you did not want this hull to get stuck on the launch ways, right? <laughs> and for that matter, you did not want to have this hull launch too fast. Uh, you know, because then it would be a runaway hull uh, that would slam into the shores of, of, of New Jersey, which was right across the river, right, uh, from Cramp. So you kind of see this here. Um, they put dummy propellers on. Uh, one of the problems that they faced really throughout, throughout the um, uh, Cleveland class program at Cramp was uh, the propeller makers did not deliver the, the, the screw propellers fast enough. And, you know, and again, I mean, they had to, they had to deliver those and manufacture those um, with, with great care and, you know, involving quite significant, quite significant amounts of, of, uh, 
of precision work. Uh, you guys did not take off any of the propellers of, of Little Rock, did you? No, I guess not. Um, but in any event, so, uh, you know, they did this, they did this in Philadelphia uh, for, for the New Jersey. And uh, I mean, you kind of get a sense of just, you know, the tremendous, the tremendous amount of, of uh, or, you know, the tremendous size of these things, right? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I got to, I got a, a little delay, uh, okay. doctor. But uh, so for the Little Rock, she does have her propellers, is the best of my knowledge. The USS, the Sullivans, we've had them removed and we're getting them bronzed up again. Uh, and also for our croaker, the submarine, the propellers are not currently with the sh with the boat. Ah, okay, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, again, you kind of get a sense of, of the sheer size of oh, these things, right? Yeah, what do we have? Yeah, here they're being cast, right? Uh, again, uh, you know, you kind of have here, you know, people, you know, and you have to heat this to a certain temperature, the bronze you do. Um, a certain temperature, and you know, the, you can't measure this. Back then, they didn't have they didn't have thermometers that they stuck in, into this molten mass. You had to be able to tell by the color does this have the right temperature to be cast. Right. So again, I mean, it takes guys who've done this job, who've done it before. Right? Um, all right, what else? Yeah. So you know, here's the steel sheets waiting, waiting for for the final place in the ship uh, gives you sense. Uh, you know, I, these are just ordinary hull plates um, that those are battleship hull plates, again, uh, uh, from the Philadelphia Navy Yard. But, uh, uh, you know, I mean, these things, they were they were made in, um, they were made for the most part really in Pittsburgh and in Bethlehem, PA, and then shipped down to Philly, uh, or for that matter, to, to, um, to, to uh, well, to Newport News down in Virginia, They've shipped them all the way up to uh, Bath Ironworks up in Maine. Uh, of course, the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, you know, there's lots of more. There's this, uh, the Charleston Navy Yard. Um, the West Coast got supplied by the steel makers in Pennsylvania uh, because there are no good steel mills, uh, you know, in California and, 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 you know, in Oregon and Washington State. So a lot of this stuff had to be shipped by, by, by rail. Um, gives you sense, uh, you know, again, of the of the whole subcontracting business that is going on in naval shipbuilding. All right, here's an interesting one. Um, as far as constructing constructing the hulls, right? Um, a lot of this stuff, you know, it did involve overhead cranes. The Americans were really, really good at this. Uh, what you see here is a pre-assembled, a pre-assembled bow section. So what they did here, the, the, again, the, this is in Philadelphia, this uh, uh, USS Princeton, that's the second Princeton for those of you who are a little bit familiar with, uh, with the history of the Second World War, but uh, you know, this is an Essex class carrier. Uh, the first Princeton was a Cleveland class carrier turned into an independence class um, uh, aircraft carrier that got sunk, I think I want to say in Lake Lake Gulf, but in any event, uh, this, this one, uh, the, the, the print, second Princeton was laid down in Philadelphia at the Navy Yard. This section, this entire section was pre-assembled in the workshop and then hauled out onto the ways and, uh, you know, and then installed here um, and, and, and connected and, and welded to the rest of the ship, right? Um, speaks to the fact there's an enormous amount of cranage that is installed in these shipbuilding facilities. Again, the Americans are very, very good at this. Uh, you know, there, there were cranes that could carry up to 150 tons. Let me pull my light up. Um, up to 150 tons, right? Uh, you know, that is, you know, the Germans, when they built subs during the first, Second World War, they had maybe carrying capacity on their cranes for, of, of about maybe 20 or 30 tons. But, you know, this, is really one of the ways in which the Americans managed to build an enormous amount of, uh, of naval tonnage uh, because they could work in parallel on different parts of the ship. Uh, they didn't have to build it up piece by piece by piece by piece on the slip rise. So again, important part of that story. Um, the Navy Yards were really the core, uh, for my money, of heavy naval shipbuilding. Uh, Philadelphia here, uh, they built they built um, uh, two. They, they built the Washington. Later on, they built a pair of of uh, 
of Iowa's and uh, you know a bunch of a bunch of Cleveland's as well, and uh, you know they had an aircraft carrier in there too. Um, so these are really kind of the heavy hitters, if you will. What's kind of interesting down here is Puget, Puget Sound in Mayor Island, California, um, and Washington State. Uh, this is Bremerton nowadays. But um, you know these shipyards, they were for the most part really the, the last two. They they did mostly repair work for the Pacific Fleet on the war. They didn't do a whole bunch of, of new construction. Uh, Portsmouth did most well, absolutely exclusively built built subs. Um, that is uh, uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So um, that kind of gives you a sense of, of uh, navy yard construction, which was huge. Uh, the other aspect that the board book points out is, you know, we always like to lionize over the course of the Second World War entrepreneurship, right? You know, we always talk about Kaiser and, you know, and the Henry Ford built the Liberty Bomber, you know, the, um, the bombers and all of this. One of the things that my book really emphasizes the sheer extent to which the federal government financed improvements, yard improvements in all of these facilities, right? You kind of get to your Newport News, they got a ton of money really out of the federal government to rebuild their construction facilities. So did Bethlehem, so did New York ships, so did Cramp. Each of those organizations got in, you know, in excess of $20 million, which back then was a lot of money. So gives you a sense of the sheer amount of, of federal expenditures that were really involved in this. Um, these are all private shipyards. Again, uh, but they benefited. They benefited tremendously from from federal investments. All right, what else? Yes, here's an important statistic um, that tells you a little bit about the um, amount of naval tonnage that got produced by the United States. You have that. That's that black bar here, right? Um, that is the amount of naval tonnage produced by the United States. So, you know. We just completely overwhelmed uh, the Axis powers, right? You kind of get a sense here with Japan. You know, when you look at, at fleet carriers, right? And I think it's important always to distinguish between um, between fleet carriers and, and you know, and these jeep carriers that you know were really converted merchant ships. When you're talking about fleet carriers, you're talking about about Essex class aircraft carriers. We built 24 of those. And you're talking about independence class light carriers, and we built nine uh, over the course of the war. Uh, so you know that adds up to you know 33 fleet carriers that the United States states built, completed, completed over the course of the war, completed over the course of the war. 33, uh, and um, Japan completed five, five. That gives you a sense of the enormous production capacity that the United States. States brought to the table with, again, massive investments, massive government investments into private shipbuilding facilities, and uh, just tremendous amounts of money that went into the Navy yards as well. Um, so these are some of the some of the statistics. It tells you, it tells this story where, I mean, it's kind of bizarre when you kind of look at naval shipbuilding by 1943 and 1944. The shipyards were really building more ships than the Navy could find crews for. Uh, so it was really, really hard for the Navy to recruit and train enough crews, you know, to, crew members uh, to put on these ships. Uh, so, you know, once you sort of get this massive, massive machinery underway, that is this industrial machinery, uh, you know, it starts just you know, producing tremendous amounts of, of, of tonnage, right? Uh, you know, it is also partly, you know, 43 and 44 a little bit skewed because the, the, the battleships come into play um, and uh, the Essex class carriers. Uh, but again, I mean, all of this is really necessary uh, and is utilized really for, for the Pacific War Offensive. That's really for the most part where a lot of the ships went. Um, that is, uh, you know, the, the, the carriers, uh, very little really went into the Atlantic. You have to remember the Battle of the Atlantic. That was, I don't want to be, I don't want to be flippant about this, but the Battle of the Atlantic was more or less done by May of 1943. Um, and the, 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 and we can talk about that in a minute if anybody has questions about that. But the point is that, uh, that for the most part, this naval tonnage, uh, 
went into the Pacific War. And, uh, you know, that's where it was deployed. Um, again, uh, these are displacement tons delivered, right? So the United States really outproduced, outproduced uh, uh, friend and foe. Remember, Britain was on our side, right? Um, by, by, by a factor of, I want to say, five or six, uh, you know, combined. So that kind of gives you a sense of you know, the enormous, enormous production capacity that comes online during the war. So what hey, else? Parker, so, yes. Would you be able to discuss, you mentioned it briefly, but would you be able to discuss the, gov the private public partnerships that were mm. established to, uh, to uh, this is an astounding graph that we're looking at here. Uh, and I would have had no idea that they dwarfed Britain, Japan, and Germany as much as they did. But would you be able to uh, talk for a minute about uh, the public-private partnerships and how that really worked for wartime production? Yes. So, uh, you know, there were various types of, of, of uh, private part, public partnerships. I will say, I mean, the Navy Yards, uh, the Navy Yards were, you know, we had them earlier here. Uh, th this is all of them, by the way. The Navy Yards, they were owned and operated by the U.S. Navy. Uh, so these are government owned and operated facilities. Uh, and um, Again, I mean, that speaks to the fact that the Navy had a very, very long tradition of building ships in its own shipyards mm -hmm. uh, with, no, with very little private involvement. I mean, what they do do was, you know, they relied on subcontractors really, you know, to, to, to supply, you know, lots of stuff, you know, the guns, the plate, the, the plates, uh, but, you know, um, and, uh, and the machinery, of course. But other than that, uh, you know, the, the actual construction process went on in government owned and operated shipyards. Um, now these ones were different. Uh, these were again, private establishments and uh, you know, and they ended up getting government money left and right, uh, you know, because, well, I mean, it's a little bit of a complicated story because here's the thing. Um, in the thirties, there were investigations uh, by the so-called Knight Committee that revealed the sheer extent to which uh, naval contractors and really what they were called back then munitions manufacturers were fleecing the government hand over fist, were just overcharging the government. You know, we're kind of looking here, Newport News shipbuilding, nowadays they're making carriers. Newport News shipbuilding at one point, you know, made off the Yorktown, I want to say a 25% profit. That's obscene. And, you know, what happens then as a result of these revelations in the 30s, uh, there are, there's some legislation that comes into play where profits on naval contracts get, get capped. They get capped at 10%. Um, now, for the shipbuilders, uh, you know, uh, in part they're greedy, in part they can make more money building private, and... Um, and so uh, they actually, right before the war, there were a lot of, you know, I'm gonna go back for a minute here to the front picture because in a way that's kind of very indicative. I will say, you know, this is actually Bethlehem, Bethlehem in Quincy, Massachusetts, right? Um, so Bethlehem was making a lot more money on building oil tankers and freighters and, and merchant ships. This picture, it's I think from, well, you know, from, from what, like 40 or 41. But um, they could make a lot more money of merchant ships than of of uh, of these um, of, of of naval vessels. So when the Toon Ocean Navy program got underway in 1940, there were a lot of private shippers who said thanks, but no thanks. We don't want to build for the navy. We want to build for private. And that you know it's it's a it's a it's an absolute seller's market, right? And um, so uh, the navy then had to convince the private builders uh, that, uh, that they were gonna make it worth their while. Um, and that is where a lot of these, that, that's where a lot of these investments that come into play. Um, there were other private public partnerships. Uh, they were so-called um, uh, GOCO plants. Those were government owned contractor operated plants. Uh, where was the Sullivan's build? I can't remember. Where was that? Was that San Francisco? It was San Francisco, correct. Yeah, okay. Uh, is that Bethlehem as well, or yeah, Bethlehem yeah. Shipbuilding uh -huh. Company in San Francisco? 
Yes. So that was actually an established shipyard. Um, right. But uh, there were others uh, that were built during the war uh, in places, oh, you know, down in Texas. I can't remember at the moment. But, um, oh, in, uh, in, in Newark, New Jersey, um, the U.S. Steel was a co contractor operator for the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Navy built a shipyard to build destroyer escorts and destroyers in, in, uh, in Newark. And, um, and, you know, the Navy basically financed construction of those facilities and then hired U.S. Steel to manage them. Those were contractor operated shipyards and, uh, or, you know, government owned contractor operated. So this, these differences that, that uh, proliferate really during, the, during the, this period. And, uh, you know, it's not just actually in shipbuilding, it's also in, in tank production. Chrysler was, was running the, uh, the Detroit Arsenal uh, to, make, to make the tanks. Uh, you know, when you kind of look at, um, oh, uh, um, the Ford, the Ford uh, aircraft plant where they built the Liberator bombers, Willow Run, right? Uh, that, was, that, was a, um, that was a government owned, you know, Henry Ford managed that thing. And, you know, always made a big hoopla about, oh, you know, private entrepreneurship and how, you know, productive it was. He didn't pay a penny for that plant. That was a $50 million plant that was, that was financed by the U.S. government. And all the Ford people did was manage it. And by the way, they managed it poorly, uh, you know. So, um, yeah, those, the B-24s, uh, you know, the, the, the B-24 Liberator bombers. Do we have one in Buffalo? I can't remember. No, maybe. Uh, no, not that I know of. <laughs> you know, uh, well, actually, you know, that uh, there's a coffee manufacturing, you know, by the river that that has that, you know, that I think during the war was actually making airplanes. What was that? Richest coffee? Richest coffee? I can't remember. Oh, uh, there was a Ford plant that was by the, it, it, by off of Lake Erie. Yeah. Of what's called Route 5. Oh, by Route 5. That's yeah, it's now Terminal A. I, I'm sure they shifted to wartime. You know, Buffalo is really big. They had the Curtis Wright plant here. That's right. And we, and we had the Bell uh, Aircraft Corporation here, right. and they produced, you know, uh, you know the P-39 Air Cobras and That's right. the P-40s. Right. Yep. So yep. we were really we had some landing tank, uh, uh, landing ship. A uh, tank craft, yes, in Tonawanda, yes. as you were saying. Oh yeah, in Tonawanda, right? Yeah, very, yeah. very productive place. My God, they kept churning them out. Absolutely, yes. Uh -huh. That's right. That's but right. mostly planes. Well, we are getting. We have about two, three minutes left here, everyone. Uh, obviously, Dr. Thomas, if you want to continue on for a minute, please. If there are questions, ask uh, questions. I've been, I, you know, I have professor's disease. I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> So if there are any questions from the 18 participants, uh, please, uh, you can ask them now and I'll kind of monitor that. And uh, this, is, this is a fascinating talk, Warship Builders and Industrial History of U.S. Naval Shipbuilding, 1922 to 1945. And you know what, uh, Doctor, what we're going to do is I'm going to, uh, we're going to see if we can get one of those high pressure or low pressure turbine, uh, you know, cut a little hatch into it, you know, to see... Uh, can't recommend taking the whole thing off, but it would be great to, you know, have a little window or a little hatch there, you know, yes. in our engine room. So I would love that. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. No, you know, because I mean, many years ago, actually, I, I was on board Little Rock when I did the research for that article because I wanted to know what that thing looks like, right? You know, and and uh, yes, and I did see actually one of the engine rooms. Uh, Excellent. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, anything, anything in the chat here? Let's see. Anybody questions? Um, well, it says, is the book available at the museum? We will be hopefully getting the book in the museum. It did come out in November of 20, uh, November of 2020. Uh, I'm thinking for Christmas, we would be able to uh, purchase a few copies. Uh, and if not, then certainly at uh, local bookstores as well or online. I hope, I hope. It's 14 hours. That's uh, oh, here we go. There's a, uh, let's see, here's are you able to see these chats? You I can. Okay. Main bottlenecks in ship construction. Yes. Okay. I can tell you. Yeah, it was the reduction here. It was the reduction here. Um, yeah, that was the biggest pain. Um, and uh, yeah, because you had to do those precision engineering aspects of it. And it was very, very hard to do that. It was, yeah, that, that was the biggest one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, other than that, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's always problems, but uh, you know, here's an important point to really remember that the book also makes. You know, we always like to talk about, you know, when it comes to managing things, um, we always like to sort of say, oh, you know, the government is red tape and all of this. The government actually, and the Navy in particular, had a very well-oiled machinery considering the challenges that they were confronting. Uh, in terms of, of getting things together. When you look at these ships, they're enormously complicated bits of equipment that, you know, the kinds of things that you need, I mean, there's, there's tens of thousands of items, you know, manufactured tens of thousands of, you know, Kohler, you know, when you, you buy your bathtubs, Kohler made torpedo, made torpedo launch mechanisms during the war. Right uh, to recruit those people, get them into the program, and you know get them up and running, and you know switch from from you know from toilets to to you know to torpedo tubes, you know <laughs> in a matter of six months. That's a real challenge. The government did a, the Navy bureaucracy did a tremendous job, really uh, mobilizing those industrial resources, and uh, one should never forget that. Again, I mean, we have a tendency to say, oh, you know, do you want the healthcare to be managed by like the post office? Well, you know. Um, during the war, the Navy was certainly up to that task, mm -hmm. uh, again, sort of given the, given the just sheer complexity of, of this enterprise of building ships uh, for victory. You know? Excellent. Any other questions for yet another going once, going twice, three times, I think, right? For any, mm -hmm. any other questions? If not, we'll begin wrapping up uh, with Dr. Thomas Heinrich and Worship Builders. Oh, wait, there. There's one more. There you go. Steel from scrap vessels after the war reused for new naval vessels. Well, you know what? I mean, I, I when I was young and and innocent, you know, I was told that actually Gillette brought up bought up old aircraft carriers <laughs> and turned them into <laughs> razor blades, right? You know, and actually I believed that. I was like, oh my god, that's kind of cool. I want to share with it <laughs> with the battleship. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well. Yes, there, there's a certain amount of, of, you know, of scrap metal. You have to remember, well, scrap metal is actually very, very valuable. And, and uh, um, you know, there's, there's stuff that goes into battleship steel and into, into uh, cruiser steel that uh, uh, it's not just steel. There's chromium, there's all kinds of, you know, magnesium. There's all these additions that, that uh, you know, end up, you know, super hard in steel. And uh, so this is actually very valuable material. And so, yes, a lot of this got, got recycled. It was, yeah. Well, thank you very much, everybody. We don't want to take Dr. Thomas's time anymore. Than, but this has been fabulous, sir. We'd thank love you. to have you back. Uh, as you said, you got your uh, master's degree here at UB. Yes. Um, and we'd love to have you back and in person and you know, signing copies of the book. And yes, things. absolutely. So we'll definitely I would love to. Yeah, Thank great. you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you, doctor. All right. Take it easy. Bye. Bye-bye.